Well, good morning, church family. Happy Easter. Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let me welcome you. My name is Jason Smith. I have the awesome honor and privilege of being the pastor here of First Baptist Bernie. And I know that so many of you are our guests. You're here with family members and you're here for lunch and all the festivities of the day. So let me first say welcome to you. And then let me also say that you look good today. Okay. You look good. You are ready for that Easter picture. Okay. Um, We are celebrating, guys, the greatest day in all of human history, the day that Jesus rose from the dead, and it changes everything. It changes everything. This morning, we are going to look at John's narrative, uh, and he's going to show us in John 18 and chapter 21, I've titled the sermon, A Tale of Two fires. Okay, we're going to narrate these two scenes where Peter stands around a charcoal fire. And what stands in between those two scenes is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you will see that that those two scenes stand completely opposite, completely contrast because of what Jesus has done. And it means everything to Peter and also to you. And so before we read the text, I have a quick question for you this morning, okay? Look, I've been praying for this service and for this day uh, for many, many months. And my deepest prayer is that you would understand that God is near, that This story, these two stories that I'm about to narrate, these are God's stories. This is his appeal and call to you. So I have a question. That is, if the Holy Spirit stirs and moves in your heart this morning, will you respond to him? Will you be obedient? I'm not asking if you're gonna go to lunch and say that was a really good sermon or the pastor was funny or or, uh, his head was too shiny, it had a glare, all right? Simply this, if the Spirit of God moves, will you respond? Listen to John chapter 18. I'm going to read verses 17 and 18. This is the first part when Peter denies Jesus. It says, then the slave girl who kept the door said to Peter, Uh, You are not also uh, one of this man's disciples, are you? Peter said, I am not. Now the slaves and the officers were standing there, having made a charcoal fire. For it was cold, and they were warming themselves. And Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, As we have gathered together this morning to celebrate the resurrection of your son from the dead, we pray right now in Jesus' name that your spirit would open our eyes and our hearts, our minds to better understand the difference and the absolute change that Jesus' death and resurrection makes. And Father, if there is anyone here this morning that does not know you, I pray that they would leave here changed, having known that you are a God who draws near, and that today is the day of salvation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. It is the night of Jesus' arrest. He will be crucified at 9 a.m. the next morning. Jesus and his disciples have gathered together and they are celebrating the Passover meal. And Jesus has just washed Peter's feet. 
Understandably, Peter is deeply moved. How is it that his rabbi and his king washes his feet? Afterwards, Jesus will speak of betrayal and his impending death. Peter, out of love and loyalty, insists, Jesus, I will follow you wherever. I will lay down my life for you. If everyone else fails, I will not. And Jesus, with penetrating eyes, replies, Peter, You will deny me three times this very night. After dinner, they move to the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus is noticeably distraught. He asks his disciples to pray with him. And he will go off in the garden alone. And it will be the darkest, most difficult hour that this world has ever seen. The Son of God will fall on his hands and his feet and he will begin to sweat blood as he cries out in agony, begging, Father, if there is any other way, let this cup pass. He will pray three times over an hour each time, but each time he comes back and he finds Peter and the rest of the disciples sleeping. The Son of God is completely alone. Suddenly on the horizon, a mob with torches and swords. Peter rises to his feet, realizes that this is the moment. This is the moment for him to fight. And so drawing his sword, he begins to attack. He cuts off the ear of one of the high priest's servants. There is quick commotion, but suddenly Jesus takes control. He heals the cut off ear, tells Peter, put up your sword. I must drink this cup. All other disciples run away in fear, but John and Peter follow the mob at a distance. As they head back to Caiaphas, the high priest's house, the situation is intense. The adrenaline is running. Peter has now entered into stealth mode. We are told that John has connections, knows people, and is therefore able to get into the courtyard there where the trial in the night will be held. And John comes back and allows Peter to get in the gate. As the servant girl is letting Peter in, she asks him, aren't you one of Jesus' disciples? I am not, Peter replies. And then he goes and he warms his hands by a charcoal fire. Jesus is just yards away, being falsely tried. The presence of evil is so thick that one can almost breathe it in. And there by the fire, Peter can feel the darkness closing in on him. Someone asked Peter again, aren't you one of his disciples With more fervor, Peter now says, I am not. Jesus' trial now pictures hyenas that have encircled their prey. He has been spit upon, beaten, mocked, ridiculed, had accusations thrown at him over and over. And around the charcoal fire, suddenly a relative of the servant who had his ear cut off He approaches the fire and he becomes adamant as he looks at Peter. Didn't I see you in the garden? Peter is now a cornered rat. And Matthew tells us that he raises his voice and that he begins to call down curses and swore. 
I tell you by God, may I go to hell, may I be damned, I do not know the man. Luke tells us that Jesus from across the way simply turns and makes eye contact with Peter. Suddenly he remembers Jesus' words. And one of the biggest understatements in the whole of Scripture says that Peter walked out and bitterly wept. In the morning, Peter hides in the crowd as Jesus is being scourged by Pilate's men. Jesus is mockingly presented to the crowd as the king of the Jews with a purple robe and a crown of thorns. But the crowd yells out in reply, crucify him, crucify him. All the while, Peter can do nothing. As they nail Jesus to the cross, Peter is shaking. His head is spinning. How could this be happening? As Jesus cries out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? All Peter can say is make it stop. Make it stop. This can't be happening to Jesus. You see, Peter bears unbearable shame. He has sinned. Guys, he's not just sinned. He has denied Jesus. He has utterly failed himself. Friend, I am not sure if you have ever felt this sort of weight, but let me assure you that these are the darkest moments of Peter's entire life. He has never been more face to face with his own inadequacy when standing before a holy God. John's gospel is only going to mention Peter one other time between this account and the next scene with the charcoal fire. That is the morning of the resurrection. The news had come to Peter and the rest of the disciples. The women came back from the tomb. They, they said that he's not there. So Peter and John sprint. They race to the tomb. But all we are told is that Peter left there confused. You see, they did not yet understand that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Now Jesus appears multiple times to his disciples and Peter was there, but John withholds Peter in that narrative because he wants us, he wants to move us along to this next scene with Peter of what we call John chapter 21. Because days, maybe a week later, Peter has returned to his hometown. And guess what? He's gone back fishing. He doesn't know what else to do. And so he's returned to his past. He's still caught in his own guilt. I guess he didn't have what it takes. He failed Jesus. He ran back to his past as you and I often do, hoping that he might find comfort there. We are told that they went fishing all night and caught nothing. Now there is nothing worse than going fishing and not catching anything. Well, maybe add little kids, to, and then that's the worst. <laughs> you see, Peter had run back to his old life, but it was empty. And many of you know exactly what we're talking about. I know I do. Times where I felt like a complete failure in the Christian life. <clears throat> Hear me. Peter wants to reset, but he has no clue even where to start. And then John chapter 21, verse three, Jesus appears on the shore. They went out and got into the boat and that night they caught nothing. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. 
And so Jesus, calling out from the shore, he tells them, why don't you cast your net on the other side? Now, to professional fishermen who have just fished all night long, that is a ridiculous statement. But what you need to know and understand is this is exactly what happened in Luke chapter 5 when Jesus called Peter and met Peter for the very first time. Luke chapter 5 says that Peter had been fishing all night, didn't catch anything. Jesus says, why don't you throw your net on the other side? And he, he, he gets a massive haul. Well, here, Jesus on the shore tells them, cast your net on the other side. The haul is so large, they can't even pull it in. And Peter immediately realizes that's Jesus. He doesn't wait for the boat to come in. He jumps in and swims to the shore. Friend, we have to pause right here because listen, the resurrection of Jesus means that he is pursuing you. Jesus came and found Peter where he was without harshness or condemnation. Instead, tenderly and poetically, Jesus found Peter where and how he found him the very first time. Why is that such good news? Because it means he pursues you also. Where do you turn to whenever you run from the Lord? Back to your past, back to past sins and passions? See, if the prodigal son is a story to tell you that God the Father looks and is longing for your return and the moment he sees you, he gets up and he runs to you, this story here of Peter's restoration is a picture that Jesus is the hound of heaven who comes and finds you and meets you where you are. Listen, if you have accepted Christ, I've got something important to tell you. Are you ready? You are a caught fish. You're a caught fish. And he will not let you go. You can swim and you can try and you can struggle. He is reeling you in. And if you have not yet accepted Christ, friend, do you not long for God to love you like the ideal father that he is? We have lots of parents in the room. Parents, have you ever lost a child as in you looked around and you did not know where they were? I remember... Growing up, uh, my parents, uh, our family had just finished Little League and we went to Brahms that night after Little League and had ice cream and all of that stuff and then returned home. It was about nine o'clock, we get home and mom looks at dad and both of them say, where is Clay, my younger brother who's seven? I thought he was with you. No, I thought he was with you. And so you, you got to think back in those times, Brahms is 15 minutes away and there's not cell phones. You can't easily look up numbers. And so parents in a panic, right? We stay at home and dad jumps in the car and races back to find him. Okay. Now my brother will tell you even to this day, he's so proud of himself because my father found him walking home at nine o'clock at night, walking home on a major thoroughfare. And he'll, my brother will tell you, yeah, I knew where I was going. I knew the direction, but I remember the intensity and the worry and then the celebration when they found him. The resurrection means that God pursues you like a father. Now, when Peter got to shore, you know what John 21 verse 9 says? Check this out. So when they got to the land, they saw already made, Jesus already made a charcoal fire. That morning, the disciples and Jesus will share breakfast and then verses 15, 16, and 17 narrate to us 
that Jesus, sitting around a charcoal fire, will ask Peter three times, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Did you know that there are only two spots in the whole of Bible where charcoal fire is ever mentioned? In Peter's denial and right here. You can imagine that the smell of that fire immediately brought Peter back to that night. He feels the weight and the guilt closing in because Jesus has intentionally reset the scene. Friend, the resurrection means that your sin has been paid. Here's the beauty of this scene, okay? This is God's poetry written for you and for me. Jesus is reminding Peter of his sin. Now, it's not in a harsh or a condemning way, but Jesus is making Peter look directly at it, head on. Why is this important? Because there's not this awkward silence pretending that everything is okay whenever it isn't. You know that person from high school that stabbed you in the back and you see them at a reunion and you just pretend like everything's okay and you don't ever address the elephant in the room. Not Jesus. Because three times around a charcoal fire, Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? You see, it is a restoration of the three denials. It's why in verse 17, it says that Peter was deeply grieved whenever he asked him the third time because he remembers the curses that he called down upon himself and he remembers the look in Jesus' eye at that denial. But between the first charcoal fire and the second charcoal fire is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and that changes everything. So now Jesus can look right at Peter's oath of denial and declare, your sin has been forgiven. Your sin has been paid. Friend, do you know that your sin has been paid for? The Bible teaches with clarity that there is a book in heaven that is written inside of it every sin that you have ever committed. It is called your certificate of debt. And one day, at the end of your life, you will stand before the King of Kings and your book will be opened. Do you know that your certificate of debt has been marked paid in full? So many men do not know they're standing before a holy God. They say, I hope my good works outweigh my bad. I hope I get into heaven. You know, I'd like to think that God is just a forgiving God who will overlook my failures. Listen to me, that is not how it works. Do you know him? Do you know that Jesus has paid for your sins? Only when you place your faith, your full trust in the finished work of Jesus on the cross, only then is the blood applied to your account. Otherwise, friend, you are only standing in your own sin. And that is nothing more than misplaced hope. As if God is going to have amnesia and forget all that you have done. That ignores God's holy character. But did you know that the Christian celebrates? That's what today is. It is a celebration that my sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole, was nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. You see, the resurrection means that Jesus pursues you. It also means that Jesus' death has paid for your sin. But there's one more. It also means that Jesus redeems you. 
Peter denied Jesus three times. But what I want you to note from this account, Jesus doesn't just forgive Peter, he redeems him. Jesus gives Peter a redo. He resets the scene and now allows him to get it right. Right? Three times Peter gets to say, yes, Jesus, I love you. Guys, that is redemption. And then you know what Jesus says to him next? He says, feed my sheep. That, that's a term for be a leader in my church. Peter just denied Jesus three times, and now Jesus is restoring him to leadership within the church. And Jesus does the same for us. He's making us new. He's calling us forward into life. Praise God that I am not who I was when he first saved me. I'm nowhere near perfect, but I am not the same. You know, church history will record Peter's death for us. That in AD 64, Peter was captured by Nero and he was set up for execution. But someone bribed the jailer and Peter escaped. And on his way out of Jerusalem, there was, sorry, out of his way out of Rome, there was a vision along the road, and Peter saw Jesus returning back to the city carrying a cross. And Peter said to Jesus, where are you going? And Jesus said, to be crucified a second time. Peter got the message. He turned himself in. But he told them that he was not worthy to be crucified in the same manner. And so he told them, crucify me upside down. You see, on the shoreline, by a charcoal fire, Jesus hit the reset button with Peter. And he unfolds for us what the resurrection means. That Jesus pursues you. That your sin has been paid for. And that he redeems you and allows you to walk out in newness of life. Listen to me, everyone under the sound of my voice. I know that you feel the darkness of our culture closing in. That evil looms. And there is no peace. That every man does whatever he feels is right and yet is only filled with much more anger and discontentment. This morning, I'm asking about you personally. Do you have peace and contentment? Friend, true peace and contentment are only found whenever you know your maker and creator through his son, Jesus Christ. Your sin is the darkness that separates you from him. But if Jesus could forgive Peter along the shoreline after three denials, then he can forgive you. The question is, will you surrender? Will you kneel at the foot of the cross and cry out, Jesus, I need your forgiveness? So right now, all across the room, with every head bow and every eye closed, I'm gonna ask you to do business with God. This is something that only you can do. You can't have your grandma's faith or your mom and dad's faith or your brother's faith, but at the end, the Bible says you will stand before a holy God yourself. And let me ask you, have you trusted in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross? Do you know that you've been born again? If not, would you cry out right now? God, I admit to you I'm a sinner. And that if left to myself, I would be separated from you in a place called hell for all of eternity. But I've heard good news 
that you sent your son Jesus to forgive my sin. I ask you right now, King Jesus, forgive me. And I will make you my king. And I will follow you the rest of my life with your help. I love you. Thank you for forgiving me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.